Welcome to the Retro Graveyard. This time we have the Harman Kardon HK1000 cassette recorder. Sold for 350 US dollars when released in 1973. That's around 2,400 in today's money. It was discontinued only two years later in 1975. Would it have stood the test of time? Well, let's have a closer look. Harman Kardon was formed as a company in 1953. Their first product being an FM tuner. Nowadays it's owned by Samsung. They have a long-standing reputation for high quality audio electronics to this day. As you can see, this cassette deck has a top loading design, which was a common thing at the time. Let's have a look at the controls on here. Here at the top left hand side we have a counter with a reset button. And moving down there is the cassette door. On this player the tapes go in this way. It pushes down and stays in place with these two metal lips. The lid won't close unless the tape is in correctly. Then underneath are the controls. Nothing unusual here. Eject, rewind, record, play, fast forward and pause. Carrying on to the right there are two quarter inch microphone sockets with their own level adjustments above. Then four switches starting with stereo or mono. On the next switch you can select your cassette type. Standard, low noise and chrome. Then a memory on off switch for use with the counter. You reset the counter to zero at a point on the tape you wish to return to and switch on the memory. Then when rewind is pressed it will stop at the point the counter was reset to zero. And lastly a switch to turn Dolby noise reduction on or off. At the end there is a quarter inch headphone socket. And here is the power button above. Above this on the right hand side are two VU meters with a record light and an indicator to show when Dolby is switched on. Then below in the middle there's a Dolby test signal button. And below that are the recording level sliders with a record calibrate adjustment above each one. And the same for the playback level. The Dolby test signal button is used with the record calibrate adjusters. According to the manual, each time a different kind of tape is used, you should record the test signal for 30 seconds and then play it back and use the adjusters to calibrate the signal accordingly in order to get optimal performance of the Dolby system. There are similar adjustments for playback, but the manual states that they should never have to be adjusted, but if they really do have to be, then you should send off for a Dolby level set tape. Onto the back, we have a fuse on the left, then on the right hand panel there are two RCA output sockets, then a speed adjustment and two sets of input RCA sockets. One set is for low input, which according to the manual should be used to connect to tape out on your amplifier. The other set for high input would be used to record directly from a tuner or another tape recorder. Now what was said about this cassette deck in the past? Here we have an advertisement from Harman Kardon themselves in Electronics Australia magazine from November 1973, boasting that the HK1000 plays more like a reel-to-reel -reel than a cassette deck, being low in noise and wide in frequency. It also points out that audiophiles will like this deck due to the wide selection of controls to adjust, and ends with comparing the thunk of the lid closing with the door on an expensive hand-built car. According to this Portuguese review from the time, it was a high-class device, simple to operate and performs well. And this French review concludes that it has an average quality to price ratio and declares its sound capabilities as very good. Now I suspect the belts in here have perished because when testing this happened. The tape isn't turning and when I press play it doesn't fast forward or rewind either. But I can hear the motor running inside, so I ordered a new set of belts. But before I go ahead and fit them, I'm going to clean the heads and the inside the tape deck. This part slides off to reveal the heads, which makes cleaning them much easier. There are two heads, one erase head and one play and record head. Now let's take a look inside. First to take out the five screws on the base. This whole wooden case comes off very easily to expose underneath. And I've already found a piece of belt that's turned to mush. Here we can see the voltage selector. It's a little damaged in there. I'm guessing it's been used in a different voltage system before. It came without a plug, but was already set to 240 volt. To get to the tape mechanism, I need to remove this board. It's held in by three screws. The board has some connections that need removing too. Now we can see where the belts are. 
one out of three are missing. First I'm going to replace the other two belts. For the second belt, I need to remove this metal plate to access the wheel underneath. It's just a case of removing these two screws. And if I lift this part just a little, I can get the belt through without removing this piece. All done. After testing the sound I found that there was a lot of crackling and sound wasn't coming through great on the left hand side so I sprayed some contact cleaner into these sliders. That improved things but there was still an issue. I remembered seeing a couple of switches on the underside of the board I removed. So I took that back out and sprayed some contact cleaner inside there and the sound was much better after that. Now to test the microphone input. I've recorded using the left and right microphone sockets. This is a test to see if the uh, left hand side works. And this should be the right side. I'm now going to try recording some audio from another source. I need to set the recording level. There's an issue with the VU, so I will go by the one on the left as it's working better than the other one. I'll play that back now. And it seems to be doing an okay job of recording. Now I'm going to test the wow and flutter. This is the first time I've done this. I'm going to use some software called WFGUI. And why do I need to test it? Well, I don't have to, but it's interesting to know how this unit has held up over the years and whether it's still performing well compared to its original specifications. Put simply, I'm checking if the speed is running too fast or too slow and if it is fluctuating more than it should. In order to test the wow and flutter I need a cassette with a pre-recorded signal using specialised equipment. I bought a tape from a company called Pavzo that make these tapes in London. I've hooked up the tape deck to my PC and I'm going to use the software to show how it performs. Ok so I've selected the 3.15kHz tone and that is what I'm going to be playing on cassette. There are two tones that are used to test wow and flutter and there are various standards that use either the 3 kHz tone or the 3.15 kHz tone. In the spec I have, it quotes the results for the DIN standard that uses 3.15 kHz. The software has the option to select DIN, so we'll go with that setup. Ok, so I'll press play now. The frequency here shows whether it is running faster or slower than 3.15 kHz, shown as 3150 Hz. It's almost spot on, I don't think it's worth an adjustment. And the flutter is fluctuating between 0.16 and 0.23. The original specs say that we should get 0.18% DIN. So it's held up pretty well I think and doesn't seem to have any obvious issues. I just want to add in about the VU meters on this deck. Unfortunately they don't appear to be working correctly. I've looked into whether this is something I could fix myself, but most of the information I found was about stuck needles. These ones aren't stuck, they move, but the right hand side one in particular moves way up the scale as soon as I switch on the unit. I wondered whether there was some sound being generated by the deck even when it isn't playing or anything, but there doesn't seem to be. I'm just learning about the various things that can go wrong with equipment such as this, so unfortunately I won't be repairing this issue at this stage. If anyone watching knows of a reason for this problem, please let me know in the comments and maybe I will make a follow up video in the near future. So that was the Harman Kardon HK1000 from 1973. It's a great looking cassette deck, obviously the design was of its time of course. It's a high quality unit that's lasted 50 years and it's still operational. We does some cleaning which is to be expected. Of course that's not including those VU meters. Anyway, it sounds good and plays well. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this video, if you could subscribe and turn on the notifications for the new videos I would really appreciate it. Now I'm off to see what else I can find in the retro graveyard. Thanks for your attendance. <laughs>